Wednesday. Back. Feels good to be back. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to Live Fly Tying with the Northern Angler. If this is your first time, welcome. We do this every Wednesday throughout the winter, and we bring local fly tires and guides and even people that aren't local. I mean, we've had people from across the country, and they, we tie flies, and we ask questions, and we have a good time doing it. So season two finale. I can't believe we've been doing this for two years. Kind of crazy. We've had just an amazing amount of support, and I was just down at the Michigan Fly Fishing Show in Macomb, and thank you guys for all the support. It was really cool to, to have people come up to me that I did not know and just, you know, kind of grab me as I'm walking by and say, hey. So really cool. We really, really appreciate it. It's, it's a fair amount of work, but it's definitely been worth it. I think everyone is getting something out of it, and that's, that's what we're shooting for. So we're back tonight with a local tire, Mark Lord, who's going to be tying up some spinners, actually. And, oh, it feels today, I think, a little bit like Springs on the Way. We had what you said at your house. 64. 64 degrees. That's crazy. That's crazy. I mean, I've been wearing my flip-flops in the shop all winter long, but it felt right outside today. Yeah, <laughs> kinda, it was nice. I had a guy fly by me on his bike this morning, so you know it's you know it's spring on the way. So I hope so. I hope so. I hope everyone is is as ready as I am to have a driveway without ice. <laughs> it's, I still got some ice. It's but. the little things, you know. Yeah. So, um, again, if you're new, use the comment section down below. That way, I can forward your questions right over to Mark as he ties, and he's he's been doing this for a little while, so he knows how to answer some of these these great questions. And we haven't we've done a few dry flies. This is. This is what's coming up. This is what you should be filling your boxes with. Well, right as sure. yeah. It I it'll mean, be here before you know it. Oh man, it's gonna be fast. Once we get through mud season and yeah. I'm done picking up my backyard <laughs> with after the dogs have destroyed it, <laughs> we'll be into dry fly season. Yeah, it'll be close. So awesome. Uh but yeah, check out the uh check out all these live fly tying videos and uh let's turn it over to Mark here. And Mark, how long have you been tying flies? Um, basically all my life, but, uh, I didn't get into the commercial aspect of it till probably I would say in the late eighties. And I don't, I don't know if anybody, if maybe you don't remember, but, uh, Traverse Bay tackle. Sure. Larry and Jenny yeah. out there in the chalet. Oh yeah. Uh, they had a tire that, um, he got into an argument with the state of Michigan and regarding that taxes. never ever happens <laughs> yeah and he just bailed and went to arkansas oh okay he left everything there and i at that time uh, we were living on duck lake and i would buy um you know we, we, bass pike that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and he caught me in there one day picking out some fly tying stuff he said will you tie flies and i said yeah well would you help us fill in because ted's gone ted right. earl was his name okay if that rings a bell to anybody, but, and he left everything there, boxes oh, wow. and boxes. He was one of the old fashioned tires where yarn was the body, uh, rolled wood duck for the wings, clipped sure. off and Indian necks, but that's what he, that's what he used. Sure. And, um, so I started filling in there and then I, as you tie more and more, you get better and better. And, um, so I said, well, I got to, maybe there's somebody else that might want some flies. And I ended up out at Orvis and they ended up buying them and it, that's where it took off from there. Yeah. Heavy, um, real, the bulk of the commercial time probably was in like the mid 1990s through the early, like 2005, something like that. I did it for about 11 years. At your, I mean, how many, for those of you who don't comprehend this. I mean, how many flies are you cranking out at that point per year, would you say? I mean. Well, between the, the shop and the guides uh, and my own customers, and then I did all of David Reinfeld's, mm -hmm. the prints, I calculated it to be about seven to 800 dozen flies a year. Ugh. And it's a lot of time. It's <laughs> a lot of flies. It's a lot of flies. It's a lot of thread, a lot of hooks. a lot of flies. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had that vice since then? Yep. 
Oh my gosh! I've never had another vice. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yep. It's had three sets of jaws. Sure. And they broke this once trying to get um, the jaws out, so they gave me a new one of this. But this is the old. They don't look like this anymore. No, I have the. I have at least one of the more recent versions. It's a little bit more elaborate, you know, a little bit yeah. more inlay and fancy. I but... couldn't afford the the heavy pedestal base, <laughs> so I bought a little Indian one. And sure. I've never changed it. That's all yeah. I've ever used. If it's not broke, why fix it, right? Yep. So <laughs> type of what you got. <laughs> That's awesome. We got some folks tuning in from, man, Ma Bangor, Maine. I probably said that wrong. I'm supposed to use an accent, right? Her, uh, <laughs> and from Queens. That's awesome. We got people tuning in from all over. So tonight, what are we tying, Mark? We're gonna tie the first one. We're gonna tie is in the vice right now. It's a Hendrickson spinner. Um, I created this back in I think in '98. Um, if you've ever seen the Hendrickson Spinner Falls, you watch those. You can't miss them. You can't miss that I love yellow it. egg sac. Yeah. You can't miss it. And the fish key on that. And we're going to use a biot tonight. A lot of people are uncomfortable with biots. I'll show you how I do it and uh, make it a little easier for you, I hope. And it's relatively simple. It doesn't take a long time to tie it. But um, I know I was... You know, when I was getting started tying flies, I was intimidated by biots. And I think I associated them with stories I had heard about quills yep. and using, you know, how frustrating that can be sometimes. But, right. I mean, what an elegant looking fly. But I, I've i I've grown to love biots. They're, they're easy to get. They're cheap. Yep. They're easy to use. And they're naturally white, so they're dyed, yep. you know, every color you could ever want. I mean, I tie you know, purple ones, even, even on the tractors. And it's, it's a lot of fun. I think I'm excited to, to share this with a lot of people because it's such an easy way to get a segmented body. It is it's, with the color you it, want. It basically is the only thing you can use. Um, the original Borchers was tied with condor quill, California condor. Yeah. And you, that's illegal. You cannot use it. And, um, this basically is the only thing that will give you that segmentation. Right. I had a friend, um, a client, driving up from Lansing one day. He was coming up to fish the Osable, and he stopped and picked up um, some flight feathers off a turkey vulture that got hit by a car. Sure. And he brought them into the store and said, tie a borchers real quick. Let's see if this looks like condor quill. Well, it, it didn't. but um, And I, maybe that's not the right feather. I don't know. But... Um, I don't know, Michigan, what, moving back to Michigan, I mean, when I, I, I wasn't that into tying as much when I when I moved out west and I came back and I I had to relearn all the classic feathers and yarn bodies that you're talking about. It's, it has such a cool, rich history here oh, of it fly is. tying. It's, I mean, so much has well, been invented of, here. It's a lot awesome. of great tires. So. So. And we got Appleton, Wisconsin. We got, uh, I'm going to miss mispronounce this robert sorry essexville hopefully i i nailed that we got people from the driftless area this is great and if you don't know hendrickson is the first major hatch in northern michigan you know the first hatch of bugs that are bigger than than maybe an 18 you know right. and, and we see them in in 14s 12s and you know sometimes some smaller ones too but you can you you can't miss them like mark was saying this it's it's is the true feeling of spring when you see those big yellow egg sacs and floating nice down weather, in the water. Yeah. That afternoon. Oh, I love it. The spinners are at night or in the evening, but uh, it can be exciting. Yeah. So what hook are we using? Let's We can we go ahead and use, get rocking. We're, we're going to use two different hooks. Uh, the first one is uh, going to be tied on this fire hole stick. It's a size 12. It is a uh, number 419. Perfect. Uh, you can use any dry fly hook. Um, that you want uh, the Hendrickson let me find my hook the Hendrickson spinner has three tails I used to tie this I tried to tie it a long time ago with micro fibbits I gave up with that <laughs> they look nice but they're they're a lot of work they are you know you have to really work to to split them apart and and then with three tails it's hard to do that right Two tails oh is yeah easy. we're 
we're going to use moose body for the tails. And now Hendrickson Spinner has three tails. So you want to kind of align them so the tips are even. I think in nature, actually, the middle tail is longer than the other two, but something like that. You kind of gauge that with the um, shank of the hook, plus or minus, it's not critical. I know we talked about thread before we got started, would, but would you quick mention what thread you're using here? Um, I use Danville. Um, this is 70 denier 6.0. Sure. It's in a claret color or wine, I think they call it now. Yeah. Um, I don't use any other thread. I don't like uh, Unithread. It's round polyester. Danville thread is um, flat wax nylon. Sure. And that's why I use it. The egg sac is fly foam. Just cut off a little strip. And this is this is not too bright, everyone. This is how bright some of these, these egg sacs are. It's they, so well, much yeah. fun. This is the easiest way to do it. Yeah. I think you could probably do it with a bead. I've seen some some use of yarn, like an egg yarn too. They're vernil. Yep. You could, you, there's a number of things you could use. Sure. I just thought this was the easiest way to do it, and I cut it at an angle like that. If you can see that. Will you hold it right up against the hook? I'll I'll use the close up there. There we go. Everybody can see the angle. And then I tie it in on that skinny end that I just cut off and then I pull it gently you don't want to pull too hard because it will break well that thin thread can cut through foam pretty easily so right. yeah not too much thread tension there and then you just snip off like that that's nice it holds your your tails down a little bit too I when I first did, tr monkeyed with it, I put the tails on after the egg sac, but they stand up in the air right. too high, so it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't work. Now we're going to move on to the challenge, and that's the buy-it. I like to separate them. They like to stick together. Oh, very much so. When you think you have one, you've got two, and I like to tear them off the stem. And let's see if we got two here. I think we only got one. That leaves you this little curly cue on the end that you can put your heckle pliers on. That's a good tip. Sometimes they get a little slippery with those heckle pliers, so the more material you can fit in there, the better. Then we have a convex and a concave side. I don't cut the tip off. I tie that down. You need every inch sometimes that you can get. And I'm looking at the convex side of the bio. Uh, that's what I'm looking at. It's facing me. I tie that in. I don't go all the way back to the foam, though. I wait. I, I hold my thread back about two or three turns so because I, I don't want to try to wrap that by on the foam. And the first turn, this is where they either break <laughs> yep. or twist. So I make my first turn with my fingers. Now I'm looking at the concave side of the bayat. Well, using your fingers there really kind of, I bet, reduces some of that twist too. Sometimes you got to guide them. Yep. You'll know if you don't have it in there right the minute you wrap it. And you make your turns. The, the hurl of the bayat is now on my left or facing to the tail. And then you wrap. Whatever spacing you like that's up to you just make sure you have enough buy it material to get up here where the thorax is going to be and try to make your wraps even do you remember what color buy it that is mark this is, i think is just uh rusty brown okay yeah they make a rusty spinner i think is probably rusty brown or rusty spinner i've I seen them remember. in claret um mahogany and sometimes it's just splitting hairs with some of those brown shades, right. really. you got to be a little careful when you capture that because your thread can cut it. 
And once you've got it tied down, you're good to go. I've left about an eighth of an inch up there, maybe a little bit more, because we're gonna have to put our wing in there now. For the wing, we're gonna use this polypropylene. I like it for two reasons. Uh, it's the perfect size, and it gives you that um, glassine look to your spinner wing, and I cut it on the fold And then I have, and then I cut this in half. And you just kind of eyeball it. Yeah, if you've so, never used poly yarn, it has these these segments where they're kind of jointed together, almost like it's a uh, heat has been applied there, and it it provides perfect sec, you know lengths for these wings. Yeah, you don't waste a lot of it if you, no. if you can cut it on the fold and work with it yeah. that way. And we just tie that in, make them, you're going to trim it anyway at the end. Try to make them as even as you can. Well, whoops. And then figure eight it. Anytime you figure eight, it's a good idea to go in front and then in back to secure those thread wraps. The other thing I like to do is um, articulate the wing by wrapping thread wraps around the base of the wing. Like that. What that does is it lets you move the wing around. It's handy for you when you want to put your dubbing in for your thorax. We're going to use um, super fine, rusty, I think this is called rusty, rusty brown. brown for the thorax. You don't need a lot of it. I like to pull it off in strands rather than clumps. A common mistake is, is people use way too much dubbing. Agreed. Yeah. I think, you know, in, in teaching, tying, learning to dub is one of the most challenging things for folks because it's such a feel thing. And it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's easy to tell you, but, you know, to have you actually feel exactly how to twist it on and how to get it in there tight is tough. Well, that's the nice thing about the Superfine, the, the synthetic ones. It's, it's probably much. the friendliest dubbing I've played yeah. with is Superfine, yeah. And then we're going to make a, a small thorax. Then I can bend those wings back because I have that thread there and make a form a nice neat head. I'm a real, have a great pet peeve about stuff sticking out of the eye of the hook. <laughs> Me too, it, but I still do it, so. <laughs> I'll spend way too much time trying to do it. Then a quick whip finish. Now you wanna take your wing Pull them together, trim it off. How do you determine that the length of that wing, Mark? You, you guess. Okay. It's just a. It's a proportional thing, I think. Yeah. You know, it's roughly the wing should be about the sh shank of the hook in length. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. I don't like the squared off look, so I go in and after the fly is done, give it a little taper. I just trim the corners of the. Of the poly yarn, and then I had cement from underneath, 
Um, I use uh, Sally Hansen's Hard as Nails. And that's a squeeze applicator bottle. It just makes it yep. so easy to use. I thin it, though, with... Um, you get a kind of funny looks at Rite Aid from the girls when you go in to buy nail polish and <laughs> Sally Hansen's Hard as Nails. Yep. But I asked the one girl the other day, I said, do you know what a commercial fly tire is? And she said, no. And I said, do you know what a trout fly is? She said, no. I said, forget it. <laughs> so there it is. What do you uh, what do you thin your Sally Hansen's with? Lacquer thinner. Lacquer thinner, okay. You can thin it. I've watched it a couple of videos. Uh, are you familiar with Tim Flagler, I'm yeah, sure? Yeah, of course. Line oh, yeah, as everyone should be. He, um, he thins it with... Um, is that rubbing alcohol or isopropyl yeah. alcohol? Okay. He says you can, you can thin it with like two drops. Oh. I've never tried it, but it, lacquer thinner works just fine. Sure. A couple of things you could do, too. Um, I tie this fly commercially, so I don't take the time to do it. But you could put a coat of head cement on the biot itself. You could zap a gap it, probably. Yep. And you could probably UV it. And I've never done any of it, but... I'm what sure I've done, could. you know, if I'm worried about the durability, I'll put just a just the tiniest dab of Zapagap on the thread before I wrap. Yep, you can do it that because way too. My concern always with with adhesive on the top is is losing that segmented kind of. I don't know. I don't. Yep. I don't want to cover it with UV necessarily. I don't have but. time to do that when you have to tie a hundred of these sure. things because it, no. you're going too slow. You got to you got to move. You could also. Uh, if you're concerned about the wing rolling, this is this head cement's quite strong, so that's why I do it from underneath and it sucks up into that thorax. Prior to the dub of your thorax, you could zap a gap that wing right there. Sure. The problem would be you don't get to move the wing if you zap a gap it. So it's a yeah. toss up. But that's what she looks like right there. That's great. And I'll put the next one in the vise, and, and if there's any questions, um, I'll be happy to try to answer them. And I'll mention if anybody's interested in that that Hendrickson spinner fall, it's you know springtime coming up, and it's what's great is it's not a late night thing. Nope. Typically, it's it's just a seven o'clock. Seven o'clock, you can catch an early bite to eat somewhere, and then head to the river, and yep. you won't miss them. Like we said, they're no big and they're somewhere. colorful. It's just I oh. saw. I was on the boardman one year, um, and there were just literally clouds of them. You couldn't miss them at all. Yeah, it's like the little black caddis, which is around the same time or a little bit later sure. with that green egg sack. You yep. can't miss that either. Can't miss it. So um, I don't know. It's fun. It's like the the natural world's given us a an easy one, you know, for oh, the right. for the for the first few hatches of the season, which is kind of nice yes. before things get the, the a little more technical. Th yeah, the amazing thing about that egg sac like we were talking about earlier you can use other things but it needs to be that vivid yellow yeah it's it's distinctly vivid very distinct yep and uh, they key on that the, the trout um they see that that's food and they key right on it so it's a great pattern it's as you can see it wasn't very difficult to tie so right and i mean I, if anybody's interested in in fishing this you know if it's a i'll probably fish this on 4x yep Around there, you know, I don't, there's no need really to go too much lighter, you know, unless you're fishing the real small sizes and, you know, seven and a half if you're on the small streams and nine right. on the bigger streams. So five weight will do all the work you need and yep. let her rip. So I think we're going to tie a, a little bit later season fly yep. in the yeah, Isonychia yeah. next. And it's probably, I will say, if we pulled all the, all the trout guides in Michigan, probably one of their favorite well, it lasts I, forever it just keeps going and yeah. that's that's why everyone loves it and it's not a late night fly it's an, another evening duskish yep exactly type thing and you know you can just boondog or fish that pretty much into the summer and, I know. and have good success i don't so. know if this will work or not i have a picture of a fish i caught sure. on this fly. Can yeah I, yeah I oh please not my i'm not very photogenic but well, we'll put you on the regular. There you go. <laughs> uh, that's, this is what I caught it on. And we were floating. Um, a friend of mine wanted to float from Dutch John to 66. Sure. 
and he had heard that there's no fish in there people don't <laughs> don't do it it's honestly <laughs> it's, it is warm water yeah and um the f- trout that live there do get big but there's pike in there there's bass yeah. there's pan fit there's all kinds of stuff in there it's a weird little section between the trout water yep it's kind of swampy and slow and it's it's a short section and we didn't see anything except so we did see some ice nick yeah until we, this um we came around this big bend i was cold actually it was kind of cooled off and i told jeff roll the boat and we came around this corner and it was feeding and we, what we'd heard was from Dutch down to 66 guys were catching walleyes on hex flies. <laughs> so we thought we'd give that a try. Sure. But we didn't see any of that. Oh, that's too so bad. <laughs> we came around this corner and this, that big fish was feeding and this is what it took. I, I took my hex fly off and put this on and yeah, that was what I caught it on. So yeah, I think some people, you know, forget that there's other things that hatch during that, that hex you well, know, yeah. mania, if you will. I mean, you got like Cahills, you got ISOs that just keep going. You got also uh, even some caddis. So yeah, I don't think too many guys really float that area that much anyway, because the, the productivity is so sl- it's low. L- I mean, the, yeah. the chances of finding a fish like that are slim. Very slim. So um, I mean, honest. I'll talk to the camera here. Honestly, few and far between fish in there. Yeah. But the ones you'll find if are pretty nice. They live. Yeah. If the pike don't eat them, they're big. Yeah. So that's what I used. I don't know why I conventionally hackled this fly then. Uh, I recall um, one of the more popular spinners back in those days was Rusty Spinner, Rusty Gates. Mm-hmm. It was a deer body, um, brown, simple fly. But he conventionally hackled it, and I never could figure that out. I didn't know why he did that. And I said, well, I just whipped that thing up, and I'm going to try to, sure. instead of parachuting it, I'm going to do right. that. That perpendicular, that cat skill style wrap. Yeah. yeah. And I don't tie that fly. Com- this next one I don't tie commercially. but um, Just for your boxes, huh? Just for my box or for, you know, some. I have customers that want a few, and yeah. so oh, I'll yeah. do that, but. This hook is different. Uh, Firehole does not make a two extra long dry fly yet. Uh, I hope they do, but uh, right now they don't. So this is what I've always used. Uh, This is a 1280 Daiichi hook. Uh, It's two extra long size 12 dry fly. Um, I used to buy all my hooks back in those days um, from Daiichi by the thousand. You get a little white box and... 10 little white boxes sure. in there and I've still got some but pretty much dry flies I've used them up and I don't tie the numbers of flies t- these days that I did back then so it's kind of senseless for me to buy a thousand flies at a, or a thousand hooks at a time same thread my kind of my trademark is claret thread anyway The Isonychia, in different, um, a bug than the Hendrickson, has two tails, not three. A lot of guys that tie these uh, Isonychia, whether it be a spinner or a whatever, the Borchers probably would be the most commonly used fly to imitate um, the Isonychia. Some guys put three, four, or a bunch of uh, moose uh, fibers, moose body hair fibers on. I usually just, on this fly, I just put two. That's a longer shank hook, but I still go by that uh, shank length. And time in. It's always interesting. You see a little, you know, I noticed this with, with dry flies where your general pattern can be a little bit more amb- ambiguous. You know, you, you don't, you're not counting tails necessarily, but typically you'd get a little bit more specific and realistic when you go to the spinner stage because yep. I think because fish get a better look at them, yep. right? They're not going anywhere. These, these flies are spent at this point and they're yep. just totally devoid of any energy and they make a perfect target for trout. And I, 
Does that make sense? I it mean, does. do you think why um, that might be or the the I don't like the big bunch coming off the back anyway. It doesn't look right to me. Sure. And I like a real slender profile for the Isonychia. Yeah. You can make it anything you want to make it, but if you look at a borchers, conventionally tied borchers or a borchers parachute, um they're wrapped with turkey Yep. Um, your turkey feather. Turkey tail feathers, yep. and they're much thicker. The bite's going to be a lot skinnier. Yeah. So it's food for thought. Again, I we did this the first time. It's kind of redundant, but if you tear it off. And you have the, the pre-trimmed bite's there. I'll mention to folks, if you're new to them, you're going to get a package, and you may have the ones that are not trimmed, and you're going to have little pieces on each side and you're going to want the pieces that are held real tight to that stem. That's the part that you want to use, not the part that's sticking out. Right. Yep. These are all shaved right off and you want to find the longest ones you can find. Yeah. There's different lengths on uh, that. Goose just biots, on that. So goose biots uh, work the same way, but you're going to have to tie a smaller fly, much smaller. You could never tie. You, I can barely get up here with this biot. I'm sure. And these are turkey biots, we should mention. These are turkey biots. Yeah. And that goose biot is great for tails of a stonefly or a you know, a prince nymph or a copper john, something like that. Okay. But the transition is so fast yeah. from thick to thin, it makes it difficult to wrap anything of length. Yeah, and I've done some sulfurs and blue-winged olives with little goose biots, but same procedure. We don't have the egg sac to worry about. Tie it just before the tail. Hopefully it doesn't break. And it wants to twist right now. And I've got the concave side. I'm looking at it, but it's trying to twist. So I got to see what I can do here. Yeah, sometimes you just have to un unwrap these and start just start over. over. Absolutely. And don't feel like you're doing it wrong if that's what you're doing at home. It's, sometimes it's worth just slowing down and making sure this it gets started correctly because that, that sets the whole tone for the fly. It, it did twist on me. I'll, see, I'll try one more time. This is when you usually break it, too. Right. After you've had after a, you have one or two mishaps. Yep. There. Now, if it doesn't break... It broke. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can save it. And what Mark's saying here is, you know, it's it doesn't just snap off. What you usually see is is kind of this this break in the middle of it where it, it'll sort well, of wrap and but one and you can keep going with this, but by the time you tie it off, a lot of the times it, it comes off at the at the back end and flies toast. The, that taper is so thin that's where they twist and if you once you learn to use them once you use them a little bit and you learn about them you can save them and you can get it going in the right direction it's there you got to be delicate at the beginning and a little bit delicate at the end with them yeah they bunch up kind of when the they're tying off you're tying off something thick there and that more wraps when you're tying them off than you think typically and again, you got to be careful right here when you secure it, capture it. The thread will cut it. Yeah. You got to be really careful. We can use the same thing for the wing on this one, or we can use conventional poly yarn. Uh, this is a light gray colored poly yarn. I use both um, from time to time. If you cut it off from the card, you need to, if you're going to use it, you need to separate it. It's way too thick to use like this. So you need to separate it and even then take a little bit of it off or it's too much. And either one's fine. Even white poly yarn will work, but um, 
Some guys like the, always use white so they can see it. This light gray is plenty light enough to see. Did I move? We're going to articulate the wings just like we did on the Henderson. Always remember to wrap in front after you um, articulate or figure eight, wrap in front and back to secure those um, thread wraps. You can trim the wing now. I usually wait till it's over with and do it at the end. Now we're going to hackle it. If you want to get a hackle gauge to, to check your um, hackle size or use Whiting 100s that are already pre-selected for you. I've done it for so long I can tell when I have a 12 or a 14 or whatever. Because your, your, your goal is to be one and a half times the gap of the hook. Now I trim this, and I do this on every fly, even though if I'm tying 100. If you can see that, little whiskers sticking out on the stem of the hackle. If you really want to get fanatical about it, you can take your fingers and peel off hackle barbs on that opposite side where you wrap, make your first turn, you're only wrapping stem, and you don't get a lot of stuff going backwards. Right. I don't take the time to do that, but uh, you could do it. And then we're going to do the same thing with a grizzly. Generally speaking, these are necks. Um, in the bulk of what I tie, I use saddles just because they're bigger. Saddles are easier to work with. You get... You know, you can get several flies per feather. Yep. The and they're consistent, part... you know, that. but that's also the, the trouble is that you're only going to get two, maybe three sizes per saddle at the very most. And weighting, uh, if you're speaking of weighting uh, saddles, uh, he's bred that stuff down so, so small that it's hard to, I've got a half saddle that's all 16s, 18s, and 20s. I don't have any use for it. I don't tie anything that small. No, and that is that is one of the challenges nowadays. That I mean, that's absolutely true, is getting sizable stuff for our flies is a big challenge. And well, that's that's part of the advantage with the, the neck is you can, get, you can get the size you need. And that's about the only thing, to, if you want to... Uh, parachute a hex, you've got to almost use a neck. Oh, absolutely. Because the, you oh, don't can't man, find anything bigger. I haven't found any saddles for, for years hex. ago. Back when I first started, uh, Ted Hebert was around and he mm -hmm. had a lot of big stuff, but he ended up having to sell to Whiting. And um, it was, it, I'm sure Whiting was quite pleased that he did because <laughs> he didn't have any big hackle. thread up here. So you don't wrap these at the same time? No. I saw, um, who was it that you had on here that does that? McCoy? Probably. Everybody has a different system. It's always fun to see. I mean, there's always challenges with those wrapping two at a time. They never want to stay together. No. They either want to twist or they don't, you know, they separate and you get wide wraps instead of tight wraps. So 
there's guys that also will, when they're using two, um, will wrap one with the shiny side forward and then oh. flip the other one and sure. do it the other way so they go like this. I've done it, but I don't do it regularly. The brown's a little shorter, so I'll probably have to put my hackle pliers on it. But. And I get, sometimes I try to get too much on here. You sound like the rest of us now. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of, I think when most people are getting started, more more is better in everyone's mind, and the opposite is true most of the, most of the time. You notice I snap these off. I don't sure. cut them off. If I don't like anything in, in the eye of the hook at all. Yeah, if you cut them, you're definitely going to end up with get, hackle fibers in there. It's hard enough to do this. Right. So you usually have to wet your fingers, get your, get your thread ready. <laughs> and I'll spend, sometimes I'll spend more time doing this than I did to tying the fly. Sure. And what, what Mark is doing here is preening those fibers back. I know it's a little tough to see. But he's trying to preen them back and get a bump of thread in front of those hackle wraps. And yep. so he'll have a real clean eye. And if you have trouble doing this, join the club. <laughs> I mean, everybody does. There's a few things out there you can do. Number one is is what Mark's doing is, is take the time to do it. Another thing, if you really do have some issues, there's something called a hackle guard. Yep. And it's really... <sighs> It's, it's goofy to describe. Uh, it looks kind of funny, and really it's just, it's almost, it's designed to push hackle back so that you can wrap thread and even tie your fly off with the hackle out of the way. It's kind of a cool tool that you don't see very often anymore. It's, it's you know, from years ago, that was pretty standard, but. I can see where it comes into play on some of these big streamers that the guys were tying earlier this yeah. year I watched. I could see that being a real asset. I use a packer um, a yep. fair amount of the time just to push things back. Every, you know, we'll I'll do a stage of a fly and then just work the packer back, make sure everything's secure, and then. But there's there's some interesting tools out there. People make their own stuff, and it's always it's fun to see some of those different, you know, ways people make things work. Again, we're going to trim the corners. This is up to you if you want to do this. I don't think the fish care. But I think the fly looks better if you trim off those corners. And that's as simple as that. Do you ever trim that hackle underneath? I don't level flat. Sometimes I do that with yeah. with some of my hex flies. If I if I wrap on that style, I'll I'll cut it underneath. Kind of uh, there was a John Barr fly. The uh, I don't remember what it's called now. That I first saw that on, and that same style where he's got an upright wing. It's a done pattern, but he trims it underneath so it sits a little bit a little bit further down in the water. There's a couple of hopper patterns that you yeah. do that with too. I don't yep. I've done that, but I don't worry about it. Uh, once again, if you're if you're in correct proportion, just let it go. Yeah. So that's it. I I know they're both pretty simple, but they're both effective. Simple's good. I mean, I mean, this isn't. You don't go through that many of these flies, really. I mean, but you don't want to spend too much time tying them. You know, right. you just. I think it's better probably to have a range of sizes in your box, you know, for these different spinners. Yep. And then having, you know, 20 different styles. Well, of the them. sulfur spinner is a rusty color. Yeah, it's that same. Um, we have uh, the little tiny mahogany done as well, paraleptophlebia. Uh, it's probably not as prevalent on the manistee, but it certainly is on the ensemble. Um. So there's, like you said, you can have a lot of different sizes. 
Little. We did just have a question. Uh, someone was wanted to know exactly when the hex hatch is going to be this year. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I, I would love to know when it is. Uh, but, you know, if I tell people typically when they call the shop, you know, if you're going to put a, a date on your calendar to be on the water, you know, maybe, you know, third week of June, fourth week of June, somewhere in there is usually, you well, know. You kind of go along with the brown drake thing. Yeah. You know, that's how yep. I look at it. You start seeing brown drakes, there's a way, uh, what was the other old reliable issue? If the first people that saw it, hexes on Fife Lake, mm -hmm. You know you're going to have them on the river a week later. Sure, I have a I because I live two minutes from a really big lake that gets hex like Lelana, and I kind of have a a yeah. timing system where I pay attention to when when the roads are covered with them, and when I start to see them on my my door, yeah. I know I'm going to see them you know pretty soon on the river. But they're too, like so. any of the other bugs or any of the other hatches. It's all uh, temperature related, right. weather related. Oh yeah, and you went where. You get out there, it's 90, you're probably going to see bugs. If it's yeah. <laughs> yeah. 62, you're not. Right. So. Yeah, exactly. We did have a, a great question from Mike. Um, he was curious if, uh, you know, he'd love to hear from someone who ties so prolifically. What tricks did you develop over the years to be more efficient as a tire? Well, and if you're going to make money tying flies, you have to be fast. Uh, speed is everything. Um, this to me is one of the most critical parts, complicated vices with levers and dials. I don't have time for them. I put my hook in and away I go. Um, what else saves me time? You, you pretty, you learn as you go. If something saves you a split second here and there, it's worth doing. You keep doing yeah. it over and over and over. And pretty soon you have, you've saved, you're going to make money. Yeah. You spend an hour tying one of these, you're not going to make money. No. You know, no I, way. you have to tie them fast. Right. And it's all repetition. And that's, I think that's, that's it. You know, if you're, if you're not willing to really put some time in and just tie a ton of these, it's, that's when you develop efficiency is just, I, I mean, yep. I, I hate to admit it, I've thrown tons and tons and tons of flies away over the years that, you know, but they got me to where I am now where I can, you know, yeah, sit I'm down and crank happy. anything out. And, not, right. you know, it's stuff I tied years ago that, you know, in my head, I'm like, yeah, I don't really like that. The The post is too thin or it, my, you know, parachute's too tall or something silly that doesn't really matter. But, right. you know, spending the time tying all those, making those mistakes has gotten me to where I am. I'll tell you one, too, for that question. Let's take a Robert's Yellow Drake, for example. Sure. A lot of people don't know how to tie it. They tie yeah. it the wrong way. That wing goes on after the body, not okay. before it. I learned a long time, because I used to have to tie that commercially. Instead of putting your deer hair body on and then having all these butts right. sticking out this way, and yep. then you go in here like this before you can get... No, nah, that doesn't work. You learn to measure it in your mind... You know it's got a flare a little bit at the back. You pre-cut it, pinch it right down close, fairly close to the eye. Yeah. And then you do the same thing with the deer belly. Sure. The butts are going to go this way. I'm not going to spend all that time clipping those things out of there. Sure. I'm going to measure my wing, clip it, tie it down quick. And then the, the reason Clarence Robert did it that way, he has a uniform body. I've seen these flies, even in fly shops in Grayling, that are embarrassing to see. <laughs> I, yeah. You know, it's, sure. they don't know how to tie it, but there's another way that you can really get efficient is learn to measure and pre-trim everything. It's the same with the, the elk hair caddis. I remember first learning to tie that and I had, you know, elk hair everywhere yep. out of the head and I'd just sit there and trim it and be messy as can be. And now it's just measured against the shank, trim it, and you can you get good enough with thread where you can get just the right amount of deer hair out there where it's not going to fall apart and it's going to look perfect. Yep. And then you're not wasting your time with it. That's why another reason why I like Danville thread is because I've used it for all these years. I know what I can get away with. Yeah. Yep. 
I seldom break my thread. If I do, I've usually caught it on the barb of the hook. I can set my bobbins up really stiff. So learning beginners and intermediate tires, for that matter, don't tie with enough tension. Sure. They they baby this fly. And, and then mistakes happen when you have loose thread. Yep. And you, the you things slide learn, around. Yep. You have to learn to tie with tension and pull hard or you're going to have problems. Yeah. I, I encourage a lot of people, you know, if you're learning, do you want to improve your fly tying? Focus on learning a single step of that fly and then chop it off your hook. Yep. You know, just work with a, a plain hook. I mean, deer hair is just probably the, the easiest example where people want to learn to spin and trim deer hair. Yep. Say, buy a pack of deer hair. It's 3 $4. Yep. I mean, you, you can pay in quarters. I don't care, you know. Right. And put it on a blank hook, you know, trim it, and then cut it off, and then start over. And it's just practice and hone that one piece of that fly. Yep. And you will, I mean, you know. You learn. Not as easy as say with dry flies, but yep. everything else you can. It's all that repetition. And you size your own hackle rather, rather than take the time. Um, I can't afford to buy whiting one hundreds and try to make money tying flies. I sure. need. I can't do it. But you learn to size that. You don't need to take the time to look at a hackle gauge. Recreational tires, sure, do it so you yeah. know exactly what you got and yeah. where it goes. This brown hackle on this fly actually is a little bit little bit out of whack, but um, I don't take the time to, to measure it. So I'd say another one is, is just spending the time to prepare your materials. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, look at, look at successful cooks and chefs. They spend a, you know, if you've ever worked in food, the whole first part of the day is just prep prep mm -hmm. is prep and laying stuff out, you know, whether it's, you know, pulling, I, I've seen people where they have little cups and they put in just the right amount of deer hair for a dozen flies in, in one cup that's already ready to go stack. So you're not spending the time to cut assembly line essentially is what you're doing. And finding ways to do that with flies like this is it's going to make you more, more efficient. You brought in tails that were already picked and ready to go. Right. People couldn't see that on camera, but you weren't messing with a, a patch of hair trimming it. You had them picked ready to put in there that's how i do that too and i keep them in a little box and i'll line them up let's say i'm going to do a bunch of those spinners i'll start i'll put three tails out and i'm on my blotter and i'll do like a dozen groups of three so they're all ready i can just go like this with my finger let it pick them up make sure they're the same length boom time and keep right on going i'm just made before i came here tonight um I have a tie an extended body Hendrickson and I have to put the, I use mono. So instead of trying to do all that in the vise, as I'm tying the fly, I do the tails, the mono and the tails first. I put my moose on there, tie it in, a quick uh, half hitch, a little dab of glue and set it aside. So when I start to tie the fly, all I've, I've got all that done. All I have to do is dub the body, put my wing on, parachute, I'm done. Yeah. So it's prep. And I cut all those, you know, pieces of yarn up usually if I can beforehand. And it, I mean, let's be honest, I don't always prep. Sometimes it's, <laughs> you know, I'm digging, digging for just one material for half an hour in the middle of a fly. And oh yeah. well, well you, know. If you know, you know, you need to tie eight dozen of something. You count out eight dozen hooks yeah. and put them in a container because yep. you don't want to be. No, you don't want to spend the done? time digging. Yeah, exactly. So. All right, we are going to wrap up for the evening. First of all, a huge thanks to Mark for coming out tonight. Well, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. I hope somebody learned something. I did. I'm excited to go tie up some more Biot spinners and Biot <laughs> everything. I think it's an underutilized material out there, and it's just it's super affordable, and it's not intimidating. You can do it. You can tie some beautiful dry flies, yeah. everybody. So. Big thanks to Mark. Um, hoping to have him back. We did actually have someone ask if we'd do a, a special for 100 years of the Adams Fly this year, maybe. So maybe I'm going to be at the Adams Fly Festival. Yeah, check out that Adams Fly Festival. Maybe, maybe I'll try and find some time coming up for something like that. A lot of stuff coming down. Let's see. Sorry, lots of comments. This is good. Lots of thumbs up from everyone. Thank you. Um, First, I'll just wrap up this season uh, by saying thanks again. I mean, Brian, 
myself, everyone is just so appreciative of the support and we just so happy we can do this as a fly shop and put this info out there for everyone. And just a reminder, you know, you can support us. We always appreciate that. Check out the northernangler.com, but wherever you are, try and support your small local fly shops. They're the ones pushing for conservation. They're the ones pushing for regulations to protect, you know, these fisheries and educate anglers and create anglers that are conservation minded. So try and support your local fly shops. It's it's very important. Um, that's all I got for tonight. So hope to see everyone next season. Um, check us out. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. And I'm going to hit the uh, play us out music just like that. And then maybe even the fade to black. Thanks everybody. Uh, subscribe if you haven't. We'll see you soon. Get out there and go fishing.